Thank you, Rabbi Ram. We, as he said, we've known each other for over 25 years, very, very close friends. Rabbi Ram is, uh, is, is a machlokas among us, which is, which is greater, is he greater through his great intelligence and his speaking ability, or just his sweetness of character and humility? Uh, is, uh, I'm very proud to, and humbled to be co- called a friend of his. Uh, I want to thank the, um, is it Nelkin, Nelkut family who sponsored his breakfast? Uh, thank you very much, and thank you everyone who, who's, who's here. Um, I, w- I just want to begin by saying I chose the, the title uh, very carefully. Um, plagiarism is a topic, but I don't want to imply in any way that the Rishonim did anything wrong. Our assumption going into it is that the Rishonim are, are Kulam Ahuvim, Kulam Barurim, Kulam Giborim, Kulam Kedoshim. And our, we're trying to understand why today plagiarism is considered a terrible sin. Uh, but as we'll see, it was not back in the times of the Rishonim, and, and I have a theory, which may be right or may be wrong, about why things have changed. Plagiarism is not just copying. When I was a child uh, in elementary school, I thought if I took an encyclopedia article and I just copied it and changed a few words, boom, it's my original work of scholarship. That's not how it works. It's not just if you, if you copy word for word. It's if you copy an idea, a witty phrase. I once, uh, as uh, Rabbi Ram mentioned, I've been involved in book publishing, so I, I remember once I went to my parents for Shabbos, and I looked up in the Encyclopedia Judaica, you know, those old gray volumes from 1972. I was just looking up the biography of one of the Gedolim, and I noticed there was a very unusual phrase describing him. And I said, I've seen that before, but I know I've never looked up that entry. What I realized was the book I was editing had that phrase, and I caught a plagiarizer. Someone who had submitted a manuscript with plagiarism in it. But, and I caught that because that witty phrase, even using a clever phrase, is plagiarism. You have to be original in, in what you write, your ideas, your organization, the sources that you quote. Any of that can be plagiarism if you don't give the appropriate, uh, appropriate credit. So I'll give you an example from a few years ago. I don't know if anyone's familiar with uh, the columnist Fareed Zachariah. Writes in the Washington Post, used to be the editor of Newsweek. I can't say that I agree with him too often, but he's a great writer, a very deep thinker. I always respected him. He was accused of plagiarism. So he, there are multiple accusations. I looked into one of them because I said, how could it be? So here's what he was accused of, and this was considered plagiarism. I, it blew my mind. He wrote an article, every word was original, and he quoted a political figure who gave an interview, and he quoted what that political figure said. But... He didn't say who did the interview. And when that was published, he was accused of plagiarizing because someone else did the interview and said, he took credit for my interview. And I read that. I'm like, how is that wrong? What did he do wrong? But apparently for for journalists, in journalism, if you don't give credit for doing the interview, you're implying that you did that, and that's considered plagiarism. So there's a very high bar, and we're going to talk a little bit about what bars we need to worry about when we we do our own writing or when we, um, in college and in class and, and just in anything, in the newspaper... I, I once saw, so you know they have every, uh, most neighborhoods now, especially uh, uh, now that printing is so easy and word processing is so easy, they have little local newsletters on Shabbos, you know, Divrei Torah. So I once saw one in my neighborhood and I looked at it and said, quoting Divrei Torah from Rav Cook. I'm like, how is this guy such an expert on Rav Cook? Just the guy down the street, you know, a few blocks away. He's an expert on Rav Cook. It's incredible. So I took it and after Shabbos, I started Googling some of the phrases and I realized he was literally copying, pasting from the internet and putting it on under his name. So even in a Shabbos, you know, these newsletters, you have to be careful because you're taking credit for expertise that you don't actually have. So there's a, a classic book on plagiarism published in 1989. And the biggest plagiarist of that time, I don't know if anyone remembers back to those days. So if you look at source one on the sheet, so political speech. On the left... Why am I the first blank, last name, in a thousand generations to be able to get to university? On the right, someone else giving a speech, political speech. Why is it that blank is the first in his family ever to go to university? And if you consider, continue comparing, you realize it's pretty much the same passage, same paragraph, same few paragraphs from a speech. Who gave that speech this, on the second column? At the time, it was a presidential candidate, Joe Biden, who went on to become the vice president, two-term vice president. So if you remember, in 1987, he dropped out of the presidential race. And he went out to become vice president. Incredible. Shakespeare, in his day, was constantly accused of copying from other people. Plagiarist. Chaucer. Chaucer did not create any of his stories. 
All the stories he took from other people. So now let's go on to source two, one of the Rishonim, Orchot Sadikim. The Orchot Sadikim was written in the uh, late 1300s. We don't know the name of the author. It was lived in France or among the French exiles. So I'm comparing on the two columns. The second column, the column on the right, is the Orchot Sadikim. And on the left, you see earlier Svarim, one by Reb Shlomo Ibn Gabirol, and another from Rabbeinu Yona. And if you look at it carefully, you'll see that he is copying ideas one from the other. Still on page one, source number two. So, Orcha Sadikim, Ramur Chachamim, Keshetir Tzelizchaber Im Adam. If you want to become friendly with someone, first, Hachigzeyu, get him angry. Right? I, I wouldn't, not necessarily the first thing I would do with I want to get a friend, but here's how you find a good friend. Get him angry. Vim Yodel Emes. If he agrees, you know what? I concede, you're right in this argument. Bishas uh, Kasa, when he's still angry, he's Chaberlo. That's someone you want to be a friend with. That's someone you can respect, will be a good friend. Vim Lav Azovo So. That's the Orchot Sadikim. Now, if you go over to the left column, Rup Shlomo Ibn Gabiro, centuries before him, he says in the second line, If you want to become friendly with someone, get him angry. Same thing. The Orchot Sadikim copied from Shlomo Ibn Gabiro. Now, I have an edition of the Orchot Sadikim published by a grandson of Rabbi Israel Salanter. It was published in the 1980s where he shows all the sources, and you see very frequently, sometimes it's very obvious, he literally copies from the Rambam, a famous passage from the Rambam is in the Orchot Sadiqim. So to c- accuse someone of writing, who wrote a classic Musa Sefer, of doing something unethical, that's hard to, hard to swallow, I, I, don't, I don't buy it, but he, that's what he did. And if you look on, if you turn the flip the page, there's another example of him quoting from Rabbi Shibun, Shlomo Ibn Gabirol. Now, uh, just a show of hands, who, who owns an Orchot Sadikim in their, in, their, in their house, in the library? Right, quite a few, a few people have them, and it's, certainly in the shul they have one. Who owns Tikkun Hamidus by Reb Shlomo Ibn Gabirol? Yeah, nobody. I don't either. So I, I, think, I think that plays a role in what he was doing. But let, before, let, let, me, let me shock you a little more. And again, I'm not trying to be in any way confront, tr- tr- confrontational or disrespectful. The Shulchan Aruch. If you look at the Shulchan Aruch, paragraph after paragraph of condensed, summarized halacha of what you should do. It was originally intended that you should review it every 30 days, so you know exactly what to do in life. Very often, the Shulchan Aruch quotes directly from the Rambam. Now, nowadays, if we look at our Shulchan Aruch, there's a little um, commentary on the side, the Be'er Agola, which tells us exactly where the, Ram, where the Shulchan Aruch got its sources. Original editions of Shulchan Aruch don't have that. It's the author of the Shulchan Aruch taking credit for the Rambam's work. How could that be? How, how could he do that? Now, the Shulchan Aruch, he, did have, he does have another sefer called the Beis Yosef, where he goes through every source. Beis Yosef was for the scholars, the Shulchan Aruch was for the every man. So, I think the answer to this question, uh, let, me, let me take one step back, though. One thing that you do see in the Rishonim all the time, if someone says a Chiddush, Rabbeinu Tam says, nah, this is not what the Gemara means, this is what the Gemara means, they quote the Chiddush. Someone said something new, something very interesting. That you always see. They're very proud. Rabbeinu Tam said this. The Rambam said that. That they're very, they're very happy to, to, to quote. But if, if it's just an explanation of the Gemara, sometimes they'll just copy word for word from one sefer to the next. So it raises many questions, but I think there's, a, there's an answer. My own suggestion could be wrong. Otherwise, there's probably, I'm sure there's another solution. So to understand that, you have to understand the history of plagiarism. We're not talking about copyright. Copyright is a legal concept. If I reprint or even just a few pages of a book that's been published and it's under copyright so that I'm liable under American law and international law. But you know what? There are some books that are out of copyright. Books from 1908, 1910. Some books published here on the Lower East Side. I could literally photocopy the whole thing and publish it and I'm not violating any copyright. But it's still unethical. If I put my name on someone else's work, that's not ethical. That's, we're talking about the ethical issue. So let's talk about the history of plagiarism. The history of the concept, not the act. I don't want to go through every act. And we, we'd be here from now till eternity because it's incredible how many acts of plagiarism have gone on. But when did the concept of plagiarism begin? So one suggestion from a historian is that it began approximately 1440. What happened in 1440? How can I give you an exact date, exact year? 
because that's when Gutenberg invented the printing press. Changed everything. So before, before there was a printing press, so copying a book was a big deal. It took a lot of effort, right? You get, everybody's getting the, the writer's cramp just from making one copy of a book. It was very rare to have books. And so if I wanted to give, give, you, give you access to Shlomo Ibn Gabiro's Tikkun Hamidos, which nobody has, so I'm not going to copy the whole book because it's unlikely you'll get that. If you happen to have my book, so you know what? I'll copy a great passage from him so that you have access to that because otherwise you have no access. There was no Hebrewbooks.org in the 1400s. So the only way to, before that, the only way to convey and, and those sources was to copy it and to give it to you. And if it was a Chiddush, they would say the Chiddush. Who, who came up with the Chiddush. But afterwards, took time, afterwards there was a development of a profession, someone called a writer, a professional writer. And it took, it took time. In the 1400s, so, so the first 50 years, was there was a feverish work of printing books. Right, what was the, the first Jewish book to be published was, I think it was Rashi al-Chumish. And within, within maybe 13 years, there were, or maybe 8 years, there were 13 different editions of it. There were, it was just a feverish race to publish books. A lot of Jewish uh, pu- printing houses, publishing houses started. Sancino we're, fa- we're all familiar with. There were a lot of other printing houses, uh, publishing houses that came out. There were many different books. And the first 50 years of publishing a book that was published then, it's called, I'm, I might pronounce it wrong, an Icunubula. There's a special word. The only thing it means is that it was published within the 50, first 50 years of publishing. Very rare, very expensive, going to be sold at auction. After that, so in the 1500s, the 1500s is when it really came to its own, when there were millions of books that were published. Previously, maybe thousands of books for all of Europe. After that, there were millions because it was just so easy to reproduce. You didn't have to write every book. You just uh, ran it off through a printing press. And in the 1600s, you start to see accusations of dishonesty, of copying. So what happened? What happened was that there were people who were earning a living from their words. Now, in the past, you were sponsored by a patron, by some rich man. He would sponsor a scholar. So, you know, if someone stole your words, who cares? You got paid either way. But if you're getting paid from your words, if someone copies your words, they're stealing food off your table. It's a big deal. And that's when they started accusing each other of, of being unoriginal and copying and stealing. How are you going to pay yeshiva tuition if someone is taking all your books and, and, and reprinting it and not giving you any royalties? They're not paying you for that. The 1700s, Samuel Johnson published his dictionary in 1755, I believe. In that dictionary, you have the word plagiarism. Used to be plagiarism, but plagiary was a kidnapper. But the, they coined the word for this new concept of stealing someone else's ideas and someone else's words. And in 1700, it, it, became, it meant theft. Use that word, theft. So, with the Rishonim, they didn't live in a time where the idea that a clever phrase or the words used to describe something is original. There was no concept of originality. You were just describing something that is and so someone else could use that description of it because you don't own that object. You're describing a Gemara. You're explaining it. So you don't own that Gemara. So your explanation is it's free for everybody. But later, nowadays, actually we'll talk about nowadays. Nowadays, I think, the past 50 years, everything's changed. But we'll, we'll get to nowadays soon. Um, so let's talk about halacha now. I, I've just been giving you a, a brief history lesson uh, let's, about plagiarism. Now let's talk about halacha. What could be wrong with plagiarizing in halacha? Assuming that there were no... American law, which there is, what would halacha have to say about plagiarism? So I think there are three issues. And we'll try to apply these to the Rishonim as well. One is misleading. You are pretending to be more eloquent than you actually are. You pretend to be more knowledgeable than you actually are. So you look in one Tosavos and he quotes five different Gemaras, so you don't look up any of the Gemaras, you just say, these Gemaras. You seem like you know shots at the tip of your fingers. You know what? You don't know shots. Maybe you do. But if you don't know shots at the tip of your fingers, you're really just pretending to be one of the Baleotosis. And I'm not one of the Baleotosis. So I like to, t- before I start quoting Gemara's left and right, I like to tell people, look, I'm not, I just thought it was safer. Don't, don't, you know, don't, don't think I'm such a great guy. I, I don't have that kind of memory. So Ramosha Feinstein, start with a home field advantage. So he has a mind, an amazing chuva, number four where he talks about high school students who cheat on the regents. 
So let's, let's read this because it's important for many reasons. It's in theory only. <laughs> so he's telling, so Hine Badover, so he's talking to someone, what you heard, Shebishivas, Matirin Lahatamidim, so in the Shivas, they allow their students, Lignovas, Echuvas, Lahashelos, to steal the answers to the questions, Bimivchane, Hasium, Shaosa, Hamadina, on these regents, and he says the parentheses, the regents, the regents exams for a diploma. Kedei Lahonos, to, to, to trick, to lie, to Ulakabil, Asa, Taudos, Shegam, Rubitove, to get a diploma that you got a good grade, a very high, high-ranking diploma. So, so, Hine, Dover, Ze, Aser. So this is, Moshe doesn't pull any punches, he's, and he's going to get even stronger. He says, this is for sure not allowed. Lo rak me dina de machus, and not only because the government doesn't allow it, el me dina Torah. The Torah does not allow you to steal the answers to the questions. And so you might think, because it's misleading, if ein ze rak gnevas das, it's not that just you're pretending to know things that you don't know, which is also... A, not allowed. You're not allowed to be a faker. You're not allowed to be a phony. You, should, you have to be honest. You're not allowed to pretend to know things that you don't. That's also us, sir. So I think the Gemara says that a Tamil Chacham is allowed to lie and say that he doesn't know things. To be humble. He's allowed to say, I, don't, I never learned that Masechta. I'm humble. But nobody ever suggested you're allowed to lie and say that, I, oh, I learned that Gemara. No, that's not allowed. That's for sure not allowed. So, he's sure, stealing and cheating on a test is Gneva's das. But let's go move forward. Ella, dehu gam Gneva's dover mamish. You're literally stealing money. Deha, how, how could that be? Sheyir zilafarna saso bimeshech hazman. You want to get a job. Lahaskir asma. You want to hire yourself and get, get a good job. Eitzel echa lava rel sakov. You want to work in someone's business. Berov hapamim. Most of the time, bimisha gomar heitev limuda. If you have a high school diploma with honors, uh, the limud of the chol for who yara lo hatuda you show your diploma an honors regent's diploma extra gomer betov you have honors vasmach ze kibluhu shazu gnevas mom and mom you're going to get a higher salary because you have the diploma and you have an honors diploma is even higher salary every dollar that you get above what you really deserve is theft <clears throat> every paycheck is theft if you cheat on your regents wow okay. Should teach this to all the all the kids. I know I always tell my kids, I'd rather you fail than cheat. If you fail a test to tell me you had the option to cheat and you didn't, and I'll say no problem. Because uh, cheating is literally theft, monetary theft. <clears throat> so plagiarizing. So very often, so when I uh, saw so if, if, if it's okay with the advertisement, I'm about to publish a book this week um, called uh, Search Engine. It's the name of the title. It's a little internet-y. Uh, so if I plagiarize in anything in that book, so first of all, any royalties I get will be theft. But even more than that, usually you don't make money. You don't, nobody gets rich off a book. But from a book, you get speaking engagements. So if I get a speaking engagement and they pay me because they saw my book and they really liked it, I'm stealing money from that shul for that speaking engagement because I, I, I did not have that, earn that, that engagement. So plagiarism is not only misleading, it's mamish theft. <clears throat> Number one. Number two, plagiarism um, for Pirkei Ovos. You're probably familiar with Kola Omer Dover B'Shem Omro Mevi Geula Olam. If you say quote someone else as say, say say something in their name and you say their name, you may you bring the Geula closer. So that's not an actual obligation, right? It's just saying if you do that, Shkayach, we all want the Geula. You, you're bringing it closer. The first, time, first place I've seen anybody, I may, I may be wrong, uh, but the first place I've seen anyone say it's an actual obligation is in the Magen of Rome. In Orchaim Kuf Nun Vav. So Orchaim tells the halachas of da- daily life, but there's some halachas that don't actually fit in anywhere. So there's one miscellaneous chapter, Kuf Nun Vav, which just basically talks about your daily life. After shul, after davening, after learning, you go out to work, you go out to work. It actually says down in Shulchan Aruch. So you go out to work. So then they throw in everything you need to keep in mind all day long. <coughs> and, uh, let me just caveat. I actually learned in Kolo, so I have nothing wrong. I have, uh, no, nothing against Kolo. But so, uh, as you all think, the halachas, the miscellaneous halachas, so what you need to remember all day long, the Magan of, of Rome says, it's source number five here, Kol she'eno omer davar b'shem omro. If you don't quote the original source who said it, over belav. That's also. When did the Magen of Ram live? Anybody know? 1600s. 
Is that a coincidence? I don't know. So the first source I found that says you're not allowed to steal ideas from anyone else is around the time that historically uh, plagiarism was starting to solidify as a concept. Uh, either way, he's right. Either way, he's right. So that, I call that ingratitude. You're failing to show proper gra gratitude to whoever taught it to you. Or to, if you saw it in a safer, so whichever safer taught it to you. So Rabbi Aaron Levine, does anyone here know Rabbi Aaron Levine? He used to be an economist, used to teach at YU. I had a little, I published one of his books. So, and, and, that, and that, during that process, I got to get, got to know him and his rabbits in. I was in his house. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. It was a tremendous, tremendous loss. So in one of his, his books, he talks about if a rabbi is giving a shear, and he didn't really have that much time to prepare, and he took the shear out of a sefer. So his example is you're teaching Hilchus Ribis, the laws of interest, which are very complex. They're very hard to understand and to get, wrap your brain around and to prepare a shear. You take it right out of a sefer, Bris Yehudo, which is a classic sefer on Ribis published within the past 50 years. So you take it right out of that Bris Yehudo. Is the rabbi obligated to tell people, I got this from the Bris Yehudo? So Rabbi Levine, he concludes yes. You can say gently. You don't have to say, I'm an Amma Aris. You can, you can just say, you know, it's a great, it's a, this is a great shear, and I got it in the Bris Yehuda. You should all look it up. And you give a little credit, give a little gratitude. That's what he's saying. Because the author, the, the Bris Yehuda, he deserves credit and gratitude for teaching you that. So when it comes to copyright, there are two general opinions on that in halacha. There's actually a book called Copyright in Halacha, very straightforward title, unlike mine, search and, it's a very straightforward title, and he says there are two opinions in halacha about copyright. One is that you're not allowed to violate copyright because that is American and international law. Nobody says it's allowed to violate copyright, you're not allowed because it's a law. And the other says it's because it's in halacha. Because in halacha, <clears throat> someone, there is rights to an artist. So you take a picture, you're a photographer, you take a picture, you put it on the internet, Right? You want people to come and buy the high-res version of that. People take that and they steal it. And they put it on their, on the, in, in their books. They put it on their websites. So that's theft. You, you, according to this opinion, you as a photographer, you own that picture. And no one's allowed to take it without your permission. So there are two opinions. So what about Torah? Can you steal someone's chiddush or someone's idea in Torah? So if you look at source number six... This, this actually gets complicated because Torah, Hashem gave all of us Torah. It belongs to all of us. We were all at Har Sinai. The Torah belongs to all of us. So I could see someone saying, it you, it's not your Torah, it's my Torah also. Just because I didn't remember from Har Sinai and you did, it's still mine. Uh, Torah, you know, right? It's, it's the Morasha Likilas Yaakov. We all inherited it. So the Shalah lived in the early 1700s in Frankfurt. So he says like this, Od ye not sell me a very gedola. Why do you have to say something in the name of whoever said it? It avoids a big avera. And you will not steal from the person who said it. He's not saying Kneva's das that I'm fooling someone who's listening. He's saying you're stealing from the person who originally said it. This theft is more theft from money. But nobody comes, money goes. But my thoughts, you're stealing my thoughts, that's stealing part of me. Wow. Okay. In the 1980s, I don't remember exactly when, 1982, I think, was the first war in Lebanon. Was that, uh, anyone remember? 1982? So Israel, boom, went straight through. They plowed through uh, the Lebanese uh, army, and they put a siege around Beirut. Beirut. So when the Israeli army puts a siege around a, a city, right, the Israeli army is basically the, at least one of the most powerful armies in the world. It might be a small country, but they take their army seriously. So that was a serious siege on the city of Beirut. So the chief rabbi at the time, of Shlomo Goran, he objected. He said, the Torah teaches us how to set a siege. And you have to, you, set, you go around three sides, you have to leave the fourth side open, let people flee. When we put siege around a town, a city, we're not interested in killing people. We don't want them to starve to death. We want to take over the city. So go. Because if they hate, go. We'll take over the city. So he wrote an article blasting the... And remember, he used to be the chief rabbi of the IDF. 
So he knew a little bit about military history. The interesting story, when the army, Israeli army first started, so the paratroopers, so, so Rav Goran was the chief rabbi, and he w tried to get everyone, every unit, to, be, to keep kosher, have a kosher kitchen. And the, he went to the paratroopers, and they said, you know, we would, rabbi, but there are no religious paratroopers, so we don't need kosher food. So what did he do? He trained to be a paratrooper, qualified, and said, now you have to have kosher food. He knew a little bit about the army. So uh, one of his fellow lead Dayanim in the Besdin system, so one of his, from a few years ago, the lead Dayanim was Ravali Yashif. Another of the lead Dayanim was Ravavad Yosef. So we're talking about high level, like, uh, you know, through the, through the stars level of Dayanim and, and Tamir Chachamim. So one of his fellow Dayanim was Rav Shol Israeli. And he wrote him a letter, private letter, which he delivered to Rav Garan and said, I don't think you're right on this. I think we're allowed to put a siege all around. He says, you have to distinguish between a mechemes mitzvah and a mechemes rishus. Mechemes rishus is if the Israeli government with a, or, or an Israeli monarch, King David, or any of his descendants, wants to expand the borders of Israel, so he's allowed, permitted, to wage war to expand the boundaries, the borders. That's a mechemes rishus. It's optional. You don't have to do that if you're king, but if for whatever reason you want to do that, that's optional. Mechemes mitzvah is different. If we are defending ourselves from enemies who are attacking us, it's a mitzvah, it's an obligation, we have to defend ourselves. So Rav Yisraeli says, I think the halacha of putting a siege on only three sides is talking about an optional war, where you're just trying to expand the borders of Israel, so you have no right to put a siege all the way around. But a mechemes mitzvah, it's a mitzvah, just go do it. Get it done, protect us, save Klal Yisrael, save the, save the Israeli citizens. So he thought, so Rav Yisraeli thought maybe that siege on Beirut was al pi halacha. So he was surprised to see that private letter published in the newspaper the next week, Hatsofa. So apparently there was some mix-up in the office, and um, the editor of Hatsofa wanted to see Rav Garin, and he, I, I don't quite know how it happened, but somehow there was confusion, got published. So Rav Yisraeli was a little upset. So he sent another private letter to Rav Garin and said, you have no right to publish that with my permission. And here's why. So if you look at source 7 and source 8, there's a bit of a contradiction here. Source 7 is a tosefta hamizganev me'acher chaver. You're kind of sneakily walking behind one of your friends. Veholech v'shonet pirko. And you hear your friend teaching Torah. Afa pishinik raganav. So you can repeat that. And you're called a thief. A ganav. Zochel asmo. You can quote it in your own name. You don't have to quote your friend. You're called a ganav, but there's nothing wrong with that. Lo yivazu laganav ki yigno. No one's going to say anything bad with a ganav if he steals. So nobody's going to say bad about a ganav if he steals. Of course you're going to say bad. No, but if you steal the very Torah, so that's allowed. So, and not only that, it says, It's a sof shem isman a parnas al You'll be raised. You'll become the president of the shul. Umezake sarabim. And you bring all sorts of zechuyus to the, to the community and to yourself. It's a beautiful thing if you steal the very Torah. Okay. That's one source. Source number eight, though, says the exact opposite. Minayin la'omer dover la'chaveru. How do we know that if I tell you something, you're not allowed to repeat it until I tell you? Uh, until I give you permission, I say you could repeat it? Shenemar, the first puzzle in Vayikra, Vaydaber Hashem Elov Meol Moed Lemor. So Hashem calls out to Moshe, he speaks to Moshe, saying, What's that extra Lemor? How many times do you have to say the speech? So it says the Gemara that Hashem was giving Moshe Rabbeinu permission to repeat it to others. And the same with all of us. We have to give permission to anybody for them to repeat something that we say. So Rav Yishol Yisraeli says, you had no right to publish that because Bavad Omer, I didn't tell you you could publish it. It was just, it was just something I delivered to you privately. So Rav Gorin sent him an apology letter, which he published publicly. And he said, I apologize, it was a mix-up. But you know what, actually I really could. I had no, there's nothing stopping me from doing that other than basic, uh, than the basic courtesy. Because, look at the, first, the, the source we said above, it's a contradiction. One says you're allowed to steal Divrei Torah. The other says you're not allowed to repeat something until you get permission. So he says, one is talking about Divrei Torah. You're allowed to steal it. The other is other things. If I tell you anything, it's to, I'll give you a stock tip. You're not allowed to repeat that if I give you a tip on the horse races, right? I don't want everybody to know it. So then you're not allowed to repeat that until I give you permission. So, but if it's Divrei Torah, so that the first source allows it. So Rav Goran said, he, so he published a public apology to Rav Shal Yisraeli, and he said, but you know what, actually I was, I was allowed to do it, but I, of course I, I wouldn't do it, it's not, it's not, 
It's not polite. <clears throat> so Rav Yisraeli then published a public letter saying, I disagree with your reading, and here's how I understand these two sources. Through, through another source. You're not, uh, you're supposed to, we're supposed to not speak in public until, or not lane in public until we prepare three times. First, prepare on your own privately three times, then you speak in public. Why? Because you want to make sure you don't make any mistakes. You want to formulate it right, get the words just right. Now, I happen to be very talented. I could get the words wrong no matter how many times I, I practice. <laughs> but a polished speaker, you practice a few times, you do it fine. And laning also, you don't want to make mistakes. So you practice three times, then you can go up in front, and, and hopefully you won't make too many mistakes. So he said the first source is talking about when I give a shear in public. So if I give a shear in public, I've already practiced, I got the formulation down right, then you could go out and tell everybody what I said. But if I'm just thinking out loud, I'm just rehearsing some ideas, I write a private letter to my friend at Tamar Chacham, what do you think about it? So I'm not ready for it to go in public. So that you're not allowed to repeat. But, you know, they, they remain friends for many years after, Baruch Hashem, that, that story has a good ending. But it's just a fascinating back and forth. And it's re relevant to our topic because, number one, can you um, steal Divrei Torah? Is there such a concept? Uh, but both of them, both of them seem to agree, which is fascinating. If something's published, there's no problem in stealing that Divrei Torah. Once you practice and you're ready to put it out in the public, for the public to hear, you're allowed to repeat it just because of theft. That's not considered theft. It might be ingratitude. If you hear a great Divrei Torah, you should see who you, who you heard it from just of, uh, as we saw before, for two other reasons. You don't want to pretend to be a Talmud Chacham that you're not, and you don't want to be an ingrate. You want to show gratitude to whoever taught it to you. But for theft, they both seem to agree. Not like the Shalah. Shalah, writing the 1700s, says you can steal Divrei Torah. Rav Israeli Yisraeli, in the 1980s, seemed to think you can't. So let's put it all together. I don't want to wear out my welcome. Let's put it all together and then kind of talk about today. Because today, everything is, has changed, but everything, nothing has changed. Uh, the old story. Everything's different, but everything's the same. So let's talk about the journalists. We saw, we saw three ideas, three reasons why plagiarism could be bad. Right? Number one, it's misleading to others. Number one, it's unfair and gratitude to the person who told you. And number two, it could just be outright theft. So if you're a journalist, journalism lives and dies by trust. We see that today. Public trust is decreasing and journalism has less value. Uh, or at least people are finding less value in journalism. Maybe that's a bad thing, but it's just a reality. If a journalist... So if... if, if um, I think it was Jeffrey Goldberg who did the original interview. So you happen to be a big Jeffrey Goldberg fan. And so if he does an interview, you know he asked the right questions, and he pushed, and he got a good answer. But maybe some other journalists you consider to be a puff, uh, puff interviewer, not a good... I, when I do an interview, it's a puff. I just want to please everybody and make everybody smile and laugh. Uh, but if, so a real, a real journalist is pushing hard. So it all depends on who's doing the interview, whether that interview is good or not. So if I quote some interview and I pretend that I... or I don't say who did it, you don't know the quality of that quote. Is it a puff quote? Or is it a hard-nosed quote? Is it a 60 Minutes quote? Or is it, uh, I don't remember, they used to have these news shows, uh, these news uh, magazines on TV that was more of a joke. Right? TV magazine, I don't remember what it was called back in the, uh, in the old days. So whatever. So you have good interviewers and you have weak interviewers. And it makes a difference. Because journalism is about public trust. So when it comes to journalism, plagiarism has a much higher bar because we need to be able to trust and we're relying on the journalist. Music. So what goes on in the music industry was totally unacceptable in the print industry. It's called a cover. What, we call, what in music they call a cover. You re-sing someone else's song. And the print industry is called plagiarism, and you could be expelled from college from doing that. So why is it allowed in the music industry and not in the, in the print industry? Because I think in the music industry, there are, what you're really interested in is the actual performance. The originality is less important. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. It's just my own opinion. Um, but in the print industry, original al originality is also very important. Performance is less so. As you can see, I'm a writer, not a speaker. Performance is much less important to me. So, um, academia. So if you're an academic, plagiarism is a fireable offense in academia. 
Not everybody who does it gets fired, but it is, in theory, a fireable offense because it's all about the research. And if you don't give proper credit in the footnotes, you're stealing someone else's research. And uh, to some degree, uh, so Torah study, though, Torah study is about Chiddush. It's about the original idea. So at least in the times of the Rishonim, if you didn't give credit for someone else's original idea, so then maybe you're stealing his Chiddush, and that's the problem. That's why you see the Rishonim, Re says this, Rabbeinu Tam says this, the Ran, the, the names of someone who says something interesting, some new idea, that we know back, we go back in history. But the actual formulation, not so much. Nowadays, though, Oh, well, let's talk about our three, three, three columns. So you're judged on what people assume you do on your own. So in a time when the assumptions were of originality were lower, because they knew people copied other books just to make it accessible, nobody thought your formulation was original, so there's no assumptions of the reader. So when it comes to Gneva's Das, of fooling people, that didn't really apply, because if nobody assumed you were original, they figured you were quoting Rashi and explaining a Gemara. And if you didn't, that was something unusual. And it will come from what you're saying. So pretending to be a Talmud Chacham that you're not. So nobody thought you were a Talmud Chacham if you could explain a Gemara. It just meant you could read Rashi. But what about the person who told it to you? You're not being fair to him. Well, it depends. Did he care or not? So if someone said a Chedish, they cared. If they didn't say a Chedish, they didn't care. So it's not theft if, if nobody's mocked, but if nobody cares... There's a famous story uh, they say it about every Rosh Hashiva. I heard about the Chassam Sofer. He says, tells, tells people, feel free to say my Chiddush in your name. I don't consider that theft. But don't feel free to say your Chiddush in my name. I don't want responsibility for what you say. Because he said, I don't care. I'm not Makbid. So there's no theft if they're not Makbid. But today things are different. Today, so we live in an era... <coughs> of what I like to call the era of the Likud, the, the collection. There's a collection of, and, and really that's all I do, I never, I've never said anything original in my life, I don't think. I just collect what other people say, and I make sure to give credit. And that's, if, 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 you, if you read what I write, I just collect other people's opinions. So that seems to be very popular nowadays. There's a safer of, so uh, uh, the famous one, maybe the one that's probably not the one that started it, but the famous one is Shmir Shabbos Gehilchasa, where he goes through every halacha, and he, there actually is a lot of originality, but now you have everything Kehil Chasa. You have Chalamot Kehil Chasa, you have Yom Tov Sheni Kehil Chasa, you have Sussis Kehil Chasa, you have Tefillah Kehil Chasa, and it kind of, I think there's pretty much Kana uh, Tzibor, Shiloh Chakan Kahalacha, right, sending away Mother Bird. Because they collect what everyone said, and they put it together, and sometimes there's originality, sometimes there's uh, actual, they go to the Godolim and ask questions, and see in the footnote, so it's worth it to buy the book just for the footnotes. But if you don't footnote, what you take from, you're pretending to be a better malakit, a better collector than you actually are. So I think today, footnoting is much more important than it ever was in history. Now what I'm saying, I don't want anyone to think that I'm, I'm suggesting that halacha evolves over time and what halacha is today wasn't what it was then. It's not at all what I'm saying. The reversal shechter, so he once gave a shir, that's asked him to speak about modern orthodoxy. So what's he going to say? So he said, modern orthodoxy... I think he said it tongue-in-cheek, means applying halacha today to the reality of today. So it's not changing halacha, but you see in Shulchan Aruch, in any paragraph, in any simon, there's a sif aleph and there's a sif base. So when you lived in Poland, you were in certain circumstances where sif aleph applied, and now you live in, a, in New York, Manhattan, which is different than shtetl in Poland, so sif base should apply. Halacha hasn't changed, it's the same Shulchan Aruch, but he's just applying it properly to the correct uh, circumstances. So I think that same thing with the, with, the, with the ideas that we're talking about, a plagiarism, it's not that halachas change, it's that the assumptions of the speaker and of the listener are, have changed, and we have to apply halacha appropriately. So I want to just uh, end with two cases in the Gemara where you actually see plagiarism in the Gemara. You know, I think that bolsters what I've been saying. So if you look at source 9, I think we have a little, a little more time, so, source 9. Ekshalei la rafshesh es ba'urta, v'shanya b'kad musa mi b'raisa. So, it's complicated. So, I have the English translation So the, the, from Sensino. See, I, I said it's Sensino, it's not my own translation, and I take your credit. So, a problem was presented to rafshesh in the evening, and by the next morning, he gave an answer. Talk about Meiser. Okay. So, Rav Edi was the attendant of rafshesh He heard the answer, and then he went to the base medrash, 
and he gave the answer on his own. So he's stealing the Chiddush of Roshesh's. Roshesh's probably was up all night trying to figure it out, and Ravidi heard it, and then he quickly read the Bits Madrash and he took credit for it. So Roshesh has heard of it, and he got upset. And he said, whoever has bitten me, a scorpion should bite him. Can't steal something if the owner, if the originator, is mocked on it. Same thing in Menachos, Rish Lakish. He said a Chiddush here. Rabbi Lazar heard it. He went to the base Medush and he said it over like a good Talmud. You say over what your Rebbe said, but he forgot to say, I heard this from Rish Lakish. So when Rish Lakish heard about that, he was mocked. He, he was annoyed. He was upset. Because the proper thing is, if you, especially from your Rebbeim, is to quote it in their name to show gratitude. They are, your Rebbe says, your Rebbeim are the ones who bring you to Olam Haba. Someone who teaches you Torah, you have to call Rebbe because they taught you something that counts for all eternity. So you have to show gratitude and you have to quote it in the right person's name. And here we see they didn't. And that's, I, I suggest, because it was a Chiddush. It was something original. But if Rosh Hashanah would have just translated Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elkein, Hashem Echad, into Aramaic, so, no. He quoted his name, he quoted not in his name. Either way, it's, it's something obvious that he didn't expect to get credit for anyway. So I think on that we've uh, run, run out my welcome, but I, I want to just appreciate everyone for paying attention. If anyone has any, you have a question? Sure, please, go ahead. That's, okay, so here's an interesting Shiloh that came up in the 1800s. Very good question. The question is, if you don't take credit for it. So, um, so we said there were three concerns. One is Gneva's Das, pretending to know things that you don't know. Another is to steal from or fail to quote adequately the person uh, who you're quoting. And the other is that it could be outright theft. Maybe, maybe not. So this question was asked um, to the Machine Chaim, or Chaim Sofer, in, the, in Hungary in the, uh, I think probably the 1860s or so, uh, a, a Baal Tshuva. His father was a Reform rabbi. And so at the Shabbos table, he heard a great Chiddush from his father. He wanted to say the Dvar Torah in Yeshiva. But could he quote a Reform rabbi in Yeshiva? So it's an interesting Tshuva just for his answer to that. Can you quote a Reform rabbi in Yeshiva? I'm not, we're not going to go into here. We, we love all Jews, um, but you know, there's certain appropri- things that are appropriate in a base Medrash and certain, th- certain things that are not, whether this qualifies worth of discussion, but he said whatever you do, don't say it's your own idea, because that alone is Gneva's Das, you're pretending to be smarter than you are. Sometimes you shouldn't quote the person for whatever, so normally you should quote if you don't remember, look, all our memories are fallible that if you don't remember, which is probably 90% of the things that I say I've heard from someone else and don't remember so I like to give it a disqualif- uh, you know, qualifier. I probably uh, am, am plagiarizing this whole thing. I just don't remember where I heard it from. Um, look, you could, you, we're all human. And, but the least you could do is say, I'm pretty sure I heard it from someone. All you could do is your best. No, no one can expect more than that. And that's, that's honesty. And that's ethical. Sorry, uh, sorry yes? Right. So, so that's the ingratitude that you that's, so, so if I say over a Dvar Torah in someone someone's name who so with someone who passes away, they can't do mitzvahs anymore. But if I teach their Torah, it's as if they're doing a mitzvah. They're continuing so teaching through you. So it's 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 ingratitude by not saying it. You're not you're not Helping someone, it's like it's a chesed to the to the to those who passed away to say over Torah in their name. So, yes. Yeah. Two part question. The your discussion of the uh, uh, letter, the private letter to the guard. Uh, my my initial understanding would be if, if the writer said this is privilege, uh, you know, then that would put it in a certain perspective as opposed to what, we, what you described here. So I'm a little confused by that. When I think about Igros Moshe, where all the letters that were compiled, that's a good point. Thousands of halakhic, when someone may have said, I believe this, or the jerk, etc., etc., I don't believe that Moshe had to call all these people and say, Can I publish your letters? Or his the printing houses that have done so <laughs> by way of the answer. So that's one issue. The second issue is how far do you have to go for attribution? And I'm going to be a fan of attribution. Uh, very quickly, 
Some example was I heard the Brown the Russia a few weeks ago on something. The very next Sunday, I pulled over what the Brown said in the name of Dougal on, on an explanation uh, by way of example. Those who heard it was about why we have donuts at Hanukkah. So I, I gave fair attribution. Um, my son-in-law, who heard the drusha when I gave it over in the spin at the sofra, um, went online and found the same <laughs> quote. So the question comes is, as, as you earlier said, if something is published and we have access to it, where is the line drawn in the context of telling over, I heard what my rub said on a published item versus when I know Rabbi Ram said, I would like to suggest. That's a code word for his own spin. <laughs> and then I, know, then I know I would have to say, my Rav said this interpretation, etc. And if I said it without saying he said it, again, that would be theft of ideas. So, so let, me, let, me, line let me repeat the questions for the sake of the recording. So one question was, um, should we assume that a private letter is, is, is you're allowed to repeat it unless... If he doesn't say, please don't. If he doesn't ask for conf confidentiality, it shouldn't be assumed. And the second question is, uh, how far back do you have to quote? That's an excellent question. Both questions are excellent. So the first, I, I can only tell you what, I, I believe it depends on societal assumptions. And I believe the assumption today should be, or is, that an email you receive may not be forwarded unless you have permission to forward it. And I believe that's observed in the breach, because seems to be everybody forwards everything, and that's unethical. But the, the, the te in business, certainly, the ethical standard is, first of all, always write on the bottom, this is confidential, nobody reads that anybody, but you should always write that, because um, that's for legal purposes. But the assumption is, unless you have permission to forward something, you're, you're not allowed to. Maybe I'm mistaken on that, but it's def I believe it depends on what the assumption is in the, from the writer. So it, it could change in times and circumstances and countries. Second question I say is an excellent question, because Rabbi Levine, in his book, discusses that. And because he, 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 I think he quotes the Gemara, maybe in, in the Dari, maybe I'm forgetting where, where first you hear someone say, I heard Rav Nachman, heard from Rav, Rav Yosef, from, heard from this, and that Rav, and that Rav, it goes back, and then they said, why'd you say that? Just quote the first one. Rav Nachman heard from Rav Yosef, or whoever it was. So Rabbi Levine deduces from that that you only have to quote, you only have to quote the person you heard it from. You don't have to go through a whole genealogy of the Dvar Torah. You can, it's nice. But you don't have to. And then the question is, what if you look it up yourself in the original, do you have to quote Rabbi Ram or whoever you heard it from? So technically you don't, because you heard it directly from the original source. You, looked up, you found the Sefer, and you looked it up, so you taught it to yourself from the Sefer. You only have to quote the Sefer. Is that right? I wouldn't say... So there's a difference between what you're required to do, and maybe there's a, you can go a little bit further than that and to do what's right, and to quote who you heard it from. But again, if, you, if sometimes I hear speakers, they quote a whole genealogy of this Rebbe told that Rebbe and that Rebbe. I, I'm asleep by the time he gets to the actual Dvar Torah. So you've you got you to balance. Everything in life is about balance. But, uh, it's, it's, so, I, I'm sorry, were there any other questions? I think that answered, right? Um, yeah, please. It was the one, the recent in Marcus, where you had, uh, like, sort of, Mishlokish giving the laws of the... Like giving him the treatment, like, like, well, why didn't you quote Rav Yechanan? So, so like, he was upset with Rav Lazar because he said it in his own name. He said, why didn't you say Rav Yechanan's name? So I remember seeing the writes from Forshat Tom explains that Rav Lazar felt that just like, um, but like Yeshua, when Yeshua spoke, everybody knew it wasn't his own tire. Everybody knew his was his tire. So Rav Lazar, Rav Lazar felt that, that, that if I'm speaking, they know it's Rav Yechanan. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that my own mouth mouthpiece. That's why that, that was Rav Lazar's... Uh, to spin on, on how, to, how to respond back to Rishlok. Rishlok still was upset. Why did you say that in the name of Rabbi Yechanan? You know, so that, that's, 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 that's great. So again, I'll repeat that because it's so good for the recording. Okay. That the other thing was I wanted to mention, now we can understand this whole shear, what Chazal say when it says, um, besides Esther. You see, this whole thing is such a complex thing that when you give it credit to where it's due, you, Marmish, you know, there's so many different meadows that are are, are sort of, um, you know, fixed up. And so sort of all people are working on their own meadows. We're, mainly, you, you, we're mishacking a lot of bad, bad, uh, negative things. So it could be that could, could be the shot. We understand better why maybe Google oil love, you know? Great, great. So, so it's all about doing the right thing and giving, being nice to your fellows and not pretending to be someone that you're not. Be yourself. 
Nobody cares if you quote a Torah from some Rebbe. They respect that. So, so don't pretend to be something that you're not. And if you're under pressure and you need to quote someone else, so quote him. Say, I heard it here. I saw it there. There are ways to do that that's, that's respectful and respectable. Uh, it's all about doing the right thing and being fair to everybody and not pretending to be something that you're not. So thank you very much.